um, she, there you go. she was a, uh, she was a Catholic school girl and we always, uh, we always tease her and sing the, uh, the Billy Joel song. What is it? Catholic girls grow up too late. <laughs> You might as well be the one. Oh yeah, only yeah. the good die young. Only, only the good, the good die, die young. young. We only sing, we sing that to my mom all the time just to tease her. She just left this morning, but um, mm. she was raised very in a, a very uh, very Catholic environment. So I think she will find this oh, yeah. <laughs> very interesting. But but she didn't raise us in that environment, so I didn't have that quite the same thing. But yeah. um, uh, and how are you doing? You're in Massachusetts, right? Yeah, that uh, that came about because um, uh, when I was in the seminary, I had the opportunity at one of the summer workshops at the college, which was next door. They uh, we were always learning and praying, you know. And uh, I met this this woman who was also attending the thing, and of course, we became friends. And uh, that that. Uh, that didn't go over well with the with the big guys at the seminary, but anyway, and we became friends. And then when I left, uh, she continued to uh, write me, and uh, we developed a relationship. And when I got into the service and all the problems I had, she would <clears throat> excuse me. She was always always supportive and helped me out. So when I came back, she lived in uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. So when that's I a nice came, place. Yeah. So when I came home. I uh, I had to go up to Cambridge to uh, to uh, see her and, and her family and stuff, and so I got uh, you know kind of acclimated to Massachusetts. And when I decided to move out of my house, a couple of months later, I moved up to the Boston area to be near her. And that's your wife now. Is it Jane? <laughs> It's Kathleen and it's Kathleen, uh, Kathleen. Okay, sorry. My bad, my bad, my bad. No, 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 no. And we're celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary. Oh my goodness. Congratulations. That is really yeah. when, is your, when is your anniversary? Well, the anniversary was a September of uh, September, February 26th, but we're having a big celebration in, in May. February is an unusual month to get married. I mean, I think most school teachers. Oh, <laughs> most people do like we June. were school teachers. Yeah, yeah, we were school teachers, and that was our school vacation week. <laughs> <laughs> right, because they do. I remember that from the East Coast. Well, I went to school briefly in well for two years in Maine, um, but I spent a lot of time going back and forth to like Boston College and stuff, and um, and uh, and they would do that like winter break I think yeah get all the germs out of the classroom or whatever but that was not something that we had had I grew up in California and that was not something that we had had before then um so I learned about winter and it was like and then there was like Patriots Day like I remember <laughs> yes <laughs> this was nothing like we had nothing like that in California so it, it really cracked me up when I was out on the east coast but um but I, I enjoyed it. And uh, um, well, I mean, sure, I enjoyed Patriots Day because we got the day off school. But um, Patriots, yeah, Patriots Day was a, a celebration of <clears throat> it was a it's a Massachusetts holiday and it occurs in April, uh, second week of April. And it was uh, uh, celebrating the uh, <clears throat> beginning of the revolution. OK. <clears throat> against the, the British. Yes. I think I probably should have learned more about Patriots Day. I think for me, it was more just like time well, to have read, a, read, a read, school. <laughs> read Howard Fast's uh, April Morning. All right, I will, I will, I will. Um, <clears throat> and so now, okay, so, so there are so many things I love about your book. I really want to do it justice and uh, and I, 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 like I said, I read it a year ago and then I read it again. Um, I think there are a lot of in really interesting points that you bring up in a really nice philosophical manner. Like you have, it's it, the way the book is written. It has a sort of gentle manner, starting with like the seminary, but then also it has a very questioning sort of like push, like, and I, and one of the questions that I wrote down 
um, from the book is is when when you're telling yourself like when you're when you're waiting in the army before you are sent to Vietnam, I believe, and you say like, what did I get myself into? And I feel like this is a <laughs> a question that has occurred for many of my friends and for uh, and over the years, I feel like it's the question that's never going to end. Like, no. what did I no. get myself? So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, well, it, you know, it was a, um, uh, of course it was a crazy time. <clears throat> and, 1968. Uh, yeah. And I was totally, Heard it was crazy. <laughs> totally surprised when they, when they told me I wasn't going to go to theology and get ordained. And so I was absolutely set adrift and I was reaching for any, any life raft I could because I knew that the, the draft, the selective service was, was looking, staring me right in the face. And even the, even the father superior told me that. He told that to everybody, by the way. It wasn't just me. He told that to everybody who left. Okay. And uh, uh, so I was definitely set adrift, as I say in the book. You know, I was uh, uh, no longer going to be a priest, and I was facing the draft, and I had no idea what I was going to do. So uh, uh, I took the advice of my uncle, who I was was trying to be a decent guy, enlisted instead of waited to be drafted. I can't imagine had I been drafted, what would have happened. But anyway, it came to the point where after that whole year of all that decision and going through the military and then saying, wait a minute, I can't do this. You guys have to give me a, a, a non-combatant status or get, rid, or get me out of the army. I knew, uh, I, I looked back and said, how, how did I get here? What, why? And I think it was because I was um, not, I didn't want to drown. I, everything was happening so fast. And uh, so I took the first opportunity, which was my uncle telling me, enlist rather than get drafted. And uh, and I had checked all the other venues. I had checked National Guard. I had checked the, the Navy, the Air Force and the Marines as a possibility. But I, I, in my head, I said, I'm, you know, like the, like the, uh, like the Air Force. And I, I want to, so I thought the shortest, way to get freedom was to do two years with the army. Probably wasn't a great decision at that time, but I was under a lot of emotional stress. And uh, it took approximately a year for me. I mean, this whole thing happened in May of 1969 when I realized what a big mistake this was and and that I couldn't kill somebody. Uh, that's, what, that's when it occurred to me, how did I get here? And I, this book is partially a story about how I got there. That's one of the reasons why I wrote it. <laughs> yeah, and I should say, in case this is, in case we publish this on Rathbrang Tree or anything like that, that so Tom, I mean, he can tell his own story, but Tom had been in. Uh, so this is his book, Yesterday Soldier. And just in case we put this on Rathbrang Tree, I should have said this right off the bat. Um, but it is, is his memoir about his time um, going into seminary and then. Um, eventually being sort of ejected from seminary right in 1968 and then immediately have well not immediately but but quickly soon after having to go fight in Vietnam or fight as a no servant as a non-combatant in Vietnam um, which yeah. must have been such a change for you I mean did you did you feel betrayed I mean because you say you say in oh. the book this the this class start of of seminary of novitiates or whatever started with 27 people you ended up as one of five that stuck it out and then you get cut right at the time that that's going to make you eligible for the draft yeah, or for mm -hmm. oh, yeah man. so i mean yeah. how did you feel it was it was a it was an ultimate betrayal um i uh, uh had the 27 people, about 12 of them were from my town that all joined together. So we knew each other. We knew each other's families. And as one by one, they either left or were asked to leave. It got, it was like, um, it was a real attrition rate in my 
in my uh, companionship and friends. So I did not handle that well for a couple of years while I was in the seminary and my grades dropped. And I found that by becoming an outreach person to the student community as a religious person, it would, it would help me with dealing with all that loss. And so by the time I became a senior in college, I had made the honor roll. I was um, doing some very good things with the uh, student newspaper, uh, you know, writing religious articles and, um, and uh, uh, the student literary magazine. I wrote a couple of short stories for the student. So I felt that I was on the road. So when, when they told me I wasn't gonna go any further, that was, that was completely, uh, I felt a real betrayal, a real betrayal. And that was just one. I think um, there was another area, there was another point in the book after I had declared that I was going to be a non-combatant and waited for the army's decision. I had the, the chaplain incident where the Catholic chaplain came down from his, his office at Fort Benning and proceeded to rail against communism and why wasn't I as a good Catholic not wanting to kill, you know, to kill people, you know, and that sounds I, rather ironic. <laughs> well, it was, it, it, there was a contrast. If you read the book, there's a contrast between him and this wonderful Baptist minister who was the battalion chaplain of our officer candidate unit. And he had to talk to me because that's how the chain of command worked. And he was very sympathetic to me. We, we actually talked in Latin at some point because we had both studied Latin. So having this, this command, this uh, uh, big major from, uh, from corporate headquarters, from the headquarters come down and talk to me was, was, out, was, was out, of, uh, out of process. That's not what usually happened. But because my family had written him and said, please help my son, he's doing something wrong. You know, after I wrote them the letter explaining everything, they called this guy, and then he he just went the opposite way of, as the Baptist minister. So that was a church of a betrayal of my church. I grew up in that church. I studied in that church, and this guy's telling me I got to kill China, uh, Vietnamese people, whereas this little Baptist guy was very sympathetic, and his one his approval of my application was very key. So yeah, betrayal. The, there, there's a lot of that in there. And um, yeah, I did feel that way. I also felt very alone because between my family, the, the fact that my church was, and there, you know, I had, I had a ton of, uh, ton of anecdotes in the book and my editor, who you know, Kat Parnell. Kat, oh, she, she's wonderful. She's very good. Uh, she's, she was, uh, 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 she, uh, she helped me winnow it down, but there were other there were other things I had when I was being uh, mistreated by the army with this, what I call the treatment, uh, when I asked to be mm -hmm. non-combatant and they put me on all these weird details and I didn't get picking up the garbage and everything, right? All that stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm the only guy I was getting to be a real expert at garbage. Uh, <laughs> there was a, there was a, a local uh, Americans for Civil Liberties Union operation on the base. I, I don't know why, but it was there. And I went to them this, and they said, well, we can't help you. You're a Roman Catholic. You can't be a conscientious objector. I said, what? And then, and so that was another betrayal. Uh, so there was a lot of that happening. Uh, I, I, I just don't know where I got the strength to be so forthright, except that I did not waver. And that was important because if you started to waver, then the then things would get really screwy. But I I stuck to my guns, and eventually, I got some respect for that. But originally, but, um, as it started, it was really rough, and I did feel alone, and that's why, in in another portion of the book, I met uh, Price, the black soldier who became my friend, and it was a nice. Uh, he filled a vacuum for me of of the loneliness, so talk about betrayal at the end of my service at Fort Benning when he told me he was a CID agent assigned to me 
to make sure I wasn't causing any trouble. I was, I mean, that was the ultimate betrayal, you know? So there was a lot of that in there. I, uh, there's a there's a lot of subtext in the in in the act what happened to me in that whole period. Yeah, and, no, uh, there's a there's but, a ton of subtext. As I said, my editor was very good. She said, keep keep on yeah keep it keep it on track. Keep your story going. <laughs> That's and what editors do. I'm, I'm glad she did. <laughs> That's what a good editor does. Well, but I mean, yeah. it, it's it's such a multi layer. Oh, yeah story because I don't read a lot of memoirs that have so much of sort of a philosophical bent to them, which I appreciated very much in your novel. And that's because, I mean, you were studying <laughs> religious yeah. texts for, you know, six years. No. I mean, you know, I'm sure you were reading, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of things that informed the, the memoir. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, and it's 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 interesting because you're both very um, diligent, but also questioning kind of at the same time in an interesting way, which um, I feel like I have I have a few friends who have, have kind of that same bent where they're they're like, you know, I'm going to do my job. Sure. Fine. But I also know that this is. Something good is it, there's not something good happening here right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that lasted even after I left the military. Mm. And, my, and my adjustment after the military, it was a, a two-way sword because it was shortly after leaving the seminary that I went into the military. And it wasn't until I got out of the, the military that I had to face, quote, normal life as a, as a non-religious as well as a war veteran who had some, some issues with post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. which every veteran gets. Um, so uh, the, uh, it, that questioning kept, go it kept, kept going for a number of years. Um, it was, uh, I mean, I always wanted to write about this. I always wanted to write the story. I always wanted to write that memoir. That's why I kept the diary during the time I was there. You know, it was like 10 pages. And some days it was just a short entry. Other days, like when I was with the prostitute in uh, Saigon, that was a long. <laughs> I remember long, that. I know that one. <laughs> Mimi. Entry in my diary. Yeah. Recently gave a, a, a book presentation to uh, some seniors at the Catholic Memorial High School, which is a boys' private school in, in Boston. In, uh, yeah, in Boston. And, uh, they were doing a unit on what was Vietnam and everything like that. And I brought the book with me, but I said, I can't give it to you because your, your parents will go crazy. And they left me. Said, no, there's some, there's some scenes in there, which are, which the, your parents would object to. But anyway, uh, it, it uh, so that questioning, I mean, for years and uh, I'm writing that now, I'm writing about that now. But as a follow-up to this book, but uh, all during the time, it was like, kind of like you're watching a movie. I was watching a movie of myself. Mm -hmm. You know, you're separated a little bit. At the same time, you're in it. I mean, you're getting clean in those bloody garbage cans every day. And at the same time, you could see yourself. Who's that guy cleaning those garbage? I mean, it was really weird. It, and, and, you know, I suppose a, psycholog a psychologist would say you were having a, some kind of experience there. But, I, you know, you did what you had to do. You know, they, uh, there's a, uh, I, I think it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, I had, had, growing up, I had a good family and, and a good support group. So it, I had that reserve, I think, even though I was pissed off at him for calling in that chaplain. I still had that reserve of being brought up well. So that helped. kind of puts you between a rock and a hard place though. I mean oh, I sure did. Yeah. 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 I, it's funny that you, you know, mentioned and, oh sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just was uh, I was thinking a friend one of my friends was telling me about he had just been reading um, Michael Hare's dispatches from Vietnam. And that there's a point where a guy shout it was just funny that you said the, or not funny, but it was 
it seems important that you said the thing, the line about the movie, because he said there's a part where a guy shouts, I'm in the wrong movie. And I think, I mean, I think that's an important observation about narrative, like what we're, what we're told we're going to be doing, what we actually do. Uh, I mean, and, and it doesn't seem like something that has really changed, <laughs> unfortunately. No. So, no. and, and yeah. of course, yeah, and, and that is, of course, one of the classics of the of Vietnam War literature. Uh, I think I've read about five times. Um, and uh, yeah, but he, uh, well, I'm not going to go into what, what he did or he didn't do, but there's some excellent lines in there. Um, my book is, as I told the kids uh, at the Catholic Memorial, the first picture I showed them was of a helicopter assault. And I said, this is what you think of when you hear Vietnam, helicopters and soldiers jumping out of the helicopter and shooting. And then I, then I clicked a picture of me standing in the, the office uh, next to a typewriter in Vietnam holding some papers uh, that, that the general wanted me to type. I said, but this was my war. And it was, it was every much a war as, as those guys jumping off the helicopter. And then I go on to explain it to them. Uh, and uh, so Michael Herr's war uh, was during the rock and roll times. And that means that's when they were out. Um, General Westmoreland was out with these always attack, always attack, always attack. And, you know, he got a lot of casualties out of it, but he also got a lot of Vietnamese casualties too, Viet Vietnamese enemies. My war was 1969 when I was there and Nixon had just announced a drawback a drawdown. And so things, we were still shooting at people and, and I got shot at, but they were pulling back from that. So it was a different kind of uh, situation. Plus the fact I was in this huge army base, which at the time was the largest in the, in the world. There were 35,000 soldiers there. And all we did was we were moving food and ammunition from the boats to the troops and, uh, and all the stuff that that goes along with that. So it was a, it was a 12 hour a day job and in, in the heat too. So, but it was uh, a, a good friend of mine who's, a, who's also an excellent writer, Matt Brennan, Matthew Brennan. Uh, he called my base Disneyland East. In fact, I think- yeah. I, I You have a chapter. Book. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, for, for, a, for a combat soldier, a grunt, it definitely looked like Disneyland. There was hot water. There was lots of food, and you could actually get clean clothes. <laughs> but, but it was a but it was a war, you know. Just like the uh, pilots from uh, um, the Air Force who flew out of uh, Thailand, you know, they weren't being shot at till they got over to Vietnam. Then they'd go back to Thailand to their air conditioned hotel. It's crazy. Huh? Pilots crazy. get treated very well. We all know this. <laughs> Well, in, in the the army, get the, and, they get the special treatment in the army and in the Marine Corps, especially in a war zone. If you needed anything, you used to steal it from the Air Force because they always had everything. <laughs> well, we joke, we joke, too, because we are we're a Navy family, but we are stationed right near the Air Force Academy now. And oh. uh, and we just let we we it's a it's a constant source of humor is that like if you want to get the good stuff, you go to the Air Force. You don't yeah. go to Fort Carson and you don't no. go out to Norfolk, Virginia. You go, no. you go to, yeah. to the Air Force. They've got yeah. the fancy, beautiful stuff. And no one believes, like I have all these friends in the Air Force and I love them dearly, but, but they don't believe me. They're like, oh, Air Force Academy was so hard. I totally believe them. But I'm also kind of like, have you seen like, have you seen Newport News? Like, <laughs> Have you ever had to wait for three hours for a, you know, you know, because I, I get my uh, health care at Fort Carson, um, uh -huh. but my husband gets his at the Air Force Academy. I find oh. that very unfair. Oh, <laughs> I All know. It's not right. right. It's not right. Well, there, so, there was, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. There was, a, there was another element to the whole story that I, I wanted to you know, you talked about there's a, there's a philosophical thing here. There was also um, what my mother would have called, God bless her, she's not with us, would have called divine intervention. And it goes like this. 
I join the army. I go to basic training. I'm there two weeks. I get pneumonia. I spent six weeks in a hospital. And that set off a whole chain of things that happened such that I ended up uh, and I ended up going to Vietnam as a non-combatant. And what I mean by that is, so I, I had six weeks, I had to go back and go to basic training again. And that moved me along to another place where I met some other people who, who enabled me to do something. And so it was like a whole chain, getting to this officer candidate school and meeting the top sergeant, sergeant first class, who was in charge of the troop, the uh, cat, the cadets, and when I told him what I, what I needed to do, he was very understanding. Mm -hmm. Now that's not usually the case with a flutter sergeant. You know, they look at you like <laughs> Can't count you're costing me all this paperwork. But he was very understanding, and so that whole chain of things worked. And and uh, and then when I got to Vietnam, as an unassigned trooper, I fully expected I'd be in the memorial services or graves registration you know, zipping and unzipping bodies uh, or, or uh, sitting out in a, in a forward base uh, counting oil drums or something. But because the way everything worked, I met this guy from my college, Stonehill College, mm -hmm. who was go due to leave in two weeks. And he, he was able to yeah, you, know, you can't you can't write stuff like that, but I did. <laughs> what do you mean? It, it so there was a there was a whole pattern. So in one sense, there was a blessing to be sick with pneumonia. That that set off this whole chain of things. But and I don't know, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a determinist or anything like that. And God bless my mother for thinking it was divine intervention. But there is something to be said for upsetting the process that we're supposed to go through. And then opportunities come up. So I, I love very, that. I love that. Very Upset, lucky upsetting the process. Yes. Yeah. You didn't yeah. even mean to, but well, but no. then you, but you kind of did because you you know I think it sounds like you always kind of wanted to upset the process just a little, you know, just a little, like within reason, well, you know. I I certainly upset the process at the seminary by counseling the guys who wanted to avoid the draft. And, but as I, as I said in my notes to you, I felt that was my duty as a, as a religious person to help them because they were very scared people and they, and they didn't have any guidance. And I was trying to give them the benefit of my prayer and, and, and faith, which didn't go wow. over very well. There was another episode that didn't go over very well with the, with the, uh, the, the big superiors at the uh, seminary. I helped organize um, uh, with with the help, I was one of the helpers and organizers of what was called a love-in. Now, back in the 60s, you look at the face. She said, what the hell? Mr. Keating. <laughs> a love-in was, it was a, it was kind of like a mini Woodstock. Where, sure. Where bands would come. Nobody was paying anybody. You get on the campus and everybody have some beer and sing some songs. And it was all peace and loving and, you know, hippie-ish kind of stuff. And my name was on the uh, on the organizers chart, and uh, that did not go over well. But so that's part of that rebelling, I guess, part of that wanting to upset the cart. Why did you want to upset the cart? I well, I didn't see it as upsetting the cart so much as I saw it as this is what the students wanted to do, and I was going to help them do it. Uh, you know, I was only at the time I was only twenty years old, so what did I have in my brain for rationalization, but I, I, I identified so much with the idea of helping them. Because if, if, you, if you had attended school when I was there and you saw me walking down the, down the corridor in my black cassock with the <laughs> collar, the Roman collar, and you look at me, you know, who is that? Weird, you know, what, what is this? Is this guy a priest? Was, and we weren't allowed to talk to the students. We were supposed to stay quiet. The only time we were allowed to talk was in class when the teacher or instructor asked me a question. Then I would, they would say, Brother Tom, they called us brothers. Brother Tom, what do you think about the, the, the German invasion of Poland? And I could say, uh, Mrs. Smith, blah, blah, blah. But otherwise, I wasn't supposed to talk to him. Mm -hmm. So 
it was, you know, it's crazy, right? But, um, and this was a co-ed college. So I, I reached out. I was full of the aggiornamento, the opening of the window. That you taught me that word. Felt. That's how I learned that word yeah. from your book. Yeah, it was the op- <laughs> yeah Vatican II Council. Um, it it was an attempt by the church to become more relevant, and in order to become relevant, like the worker priests of France and and Belgium, who lived with the workers in the mines and stuff like that, and helped them and provided communion for them and everything. That's what I saw myself as doing. So I wasn't really trying to upset the apple cart so much as be of service to these young students. So uh, I totally, I totally understand that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty badass. Yeah. Uh, Well, it it can't be badass if you had a Roman collar on. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no it, I think that makes it more um mm-hmm. my mom also went to catholic school and they were not allowed to talk in the hallways um which oh well they the kids could talk I just couldn't talk to them oh well my mom's school they couldn't talk in the hallways wow. and they had all these crazy rules like the girls couldn't wear patent leather shoes because they thought that it would allow people to see your underwear like they had all these crazy rules um and so my mom it was really funny she very much rebelled against that once she got out of that uh out of that whole system although I think she she understands there's things to respect within it of course but it just it was too it was too much she was from Mass. she's from Massachusetts too and uh well I know you're from you were from Connecticut right but um yeah I, uh, so we've talked about what have I gotten myself into, which I think mm-hmm. is just a question that everyone can ask themselves. And then you have an interesting line. Well, I've got two, two other things on here that I mm-hmm. really, that really stuck out to me. Um, you have this line, the army had spent a lot of money and time on training me how to kill and they wanted their investment to pay off. Can you, I, I find that that is very relevant today. I, 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 I'm just from my social observations and uh, mm-hmm. I was wondering if you might want to talk just a minute about that. Sure. sure. Um, one of the first things that I was told when I asked to be designated a non-combatant and the top sergeant who was a very nice guy said to me, you got a real problem here, Keating. And I said, what's that? He said, you let the army train and feed you for nine months. And you trained with every weapon. I trained, and I was very good at it. I was M16 rifle, M14 rifle, pistol marksman, a machine gunner. I I mean, I learned all that stuff and I, I learned it well because at the time I was scared that if I didn't learn it and Vietnam was in the horizon, You know, I I need that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And he said, in the military terms, uh, because you accepted the training, you could not be a non-combatant. If you wanted to be a non-combatant, and one of my friends actually did that on induction day. He was a draftee, he didn't enlist. On induction day, he declared himself a conscience objector. And that set off a whole process for him where but I didn't do that. I enlisted in the U.S. Army and was trained as an infantry person, uh, combat infantryman. I had the, uh, the the qualifications. So the Army had trained me with a particular skill set, and they wanted their they wanted that uh, uh, investment to pay off because at the time I was in the service, Vietnam had gotten real bloody. Um, they had two major enemy uh, offensives called Tet, and we lost a lot of uh, soldiers. And so they were looking for replacements all up everywhere. There were, uh, um, uh, there was a real need. I mean, it's amazing. Um, I heard the news today that the Russians had lost something like 12, 15,000 people already. I mean, it is, it war is just a, it's just a horrible thing to choose choose lives up. And they were happening in Vietnam. So here's this kid who just got all this wonderful training who could, you know, 
shoot the uh, shoot the uh, the wings off a fly at 200 yards with his rifle, and he wants to not do that. Well, we're going to make sure we're going to send you to Fort Leavenworth for false uh, enlistment. He said, "You're going to face that." He said, "But if you agree to stay in the army as a non-combatant, you might have a better chance." That was his advice, and I took it. And uh, that relieved that legal pressure of paying back because they still use me. In fact, <laughs> you know, they, the day I got my, my uh, classification, I had papers that I had to sign agreeing to go to combat medic school, which I said, which was fine. I, you know, I, I'd rather save people than kill them. And uh, the, the sergeant uh, who was in charge of the barracks said, Think about that overnight. Don't do it till tomorrow. And I said, well, okay. So the next day came and the army had already changed its mind and said, nah, send them over. We won't send them to training because they needed bodies. So I, I was in that. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Hair. You ever seen the movie Hair? I remember my parents watching it. That's a little bit, a tiny oh, bit before God. my time. Anyway, at the <laughs> end of Hair, the guy who took the place of the hippie is on the the last five minutes of the movie is a montage of him taking the place of the man uh, uh, in the army. And that's what I did. I took somebody, I, I, I was in a slot and, and I got, that's what they were doing. They were using up their people. And uh, I mean, from the broads over, you know, the big general guys, they needed 20, they needed 20,000 soldiers that year. And I was one of them, you know? So, uh, I was able, because of the advice of that, that good top sergeant, you know, and I can't remember his name today, um, who gave me that, that straightforward advice, stay in the army, but become a non-combatant. And it eventually worked, but it took, it took four months of mostly harassment. It took letters from the president of my college, who had been my instructor, from uh, two other priests and, uh, and uh, one of my uh, uh, people from my town who attested to the fact that I wasn't a communist. You know, that was, that was the big thing. Uh, and- uh, Well, that was nice of them, I guess. And, and my own writing, I have it a copy here somewhere. I did a 12 page, thing on the army uh th you have to do a statement and i wrote 12 pages about why in fact i use some of those words in the book uh, of why uh i should be a non-combatant i sat there at the post library on sun on a sunday and i had the old microfilms mm -hmm. of, of the new york times and i was uh, i was uh with a pencil and a and a, and a green yellow pad uh, and then I had the opportunity to, to uh, uh, use a typewriter and I typed it up. Wow. It was, they didn't call them business offices. I forget what they called them, but I, there was a typewriter, manual typewriter available. So I typed it all up and, and uh, 12 pages. And that, all that worked, but it took four bloody months. Did you ever consider being a conscientious objector? I hadn't thought of it. That's the funny thing. That was why it was so striking and so, so so frightening when I'm there watering the lawn at the officer candidate school and all of a sudden it's like uh, tears were coming out of my eyes. I was weeping and I didn't know what I was weeping for. And I got really scared. And then it, you know, it's like this thing said, get yourself out of this situation. You don't want to kill anybody. And it, it was like, wow, this is like falling off the the horse, you know, uh, I, it was a complete shock to me to come up with that. Yeah. Now I did have some doubts. And as I think I said in the book, when I, when I put that bayonet against that kid's throat, after the situation got diffused, I realized I'm turning into this army person where killing was considered something to do. You know, they've trained me. They got me it got me in there, in there, but I didn't think at the time I should step out of it then. It, it was kind of weird. And uh, 
as my good friend who I said at adductions declared himself a conscious objector, he said to me, uh, we had talked as I read, I sent him a copy of the book and he liked it. And he said, you know, Keating, I can't believe it never occurred to you to do what I did. And I said, yeah, I, call me stupid. I mean, what have saved? I don't think you were stupid. Do you think it had to do with your religious background? I mean, there is a, no, a culture that, of that, obedience that has to do with bingo. organized religion and Catholicism and that sort of thing. Very much so. And, and, and there was another, and yes. And I was, I had stuck my neck out for this uh, non-combatant status thing. And I did literally was alone for four months with the exception of the, of the criminal investigation, the officer who was <laughs> going to be my friend. It's so um, sad. It makes me really sad, actually. Oh, oh no, it was just, it was uh, bizarre. But anyway, uh, and the treatment I had got, and I also got some of that treatment in Vietnam too, which we didn't write in the book. But uh, uh, because when I got there and I got to the unit, I was in the majors that were in the office looked at me like I was a communist. In fact, one of them told me I was. And so there were certain <laughs> things like that. I, but anyway, it scared me into conformity. I didn't, and I think I wrote that in the book, uh, the psychiatric assistant at the uh, main base in Fort Benning when I went to the psychiatrist and asked me if I had a hole in my head and what day it was and do I hear a voice? You know, yes, saying, if you had a hole in your head, what is that? Well, he, he wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy because you must be crazy to want to be a conscious detector. Huh, interesting. Uh, okay. That's weird. But anyway, his, his enlisted assistant uh, was a nice guy. He had gone to University of Detroit, which was a Catholic school. So he kind of knew what's going on. And he befriended me for real. And he said, whatever you do, whatever comes out of this thing, he said, don't mess around, be a good soldier because they're looking at you every day. And he, he might've known that that guy was looking at me, but I, I was always making my bunk. I was always shining my boots and yes, sir, no, sir. And uh, they, it paid off. I, it wasn't a, I mean, I, I wasn't a real troublemaker, even though I should have been, but um, that conformity, that obedience that had been drilled into me through all my Catholic schools, the nuns, and then in the seminary, that kind of was a, a bit of a saving grace mm. because I, you know, uh, but- Kept you under the radar uh, a little. It did. And then when I got over to Vietnam, it, I kept doing that. I kept doing that, even though I got, you know, I, uh, I, when I, when you arrive at a unit in the war zone, they issue you a rifle. So I, so I got, I get to the armorer and I said, I can't take that weapon. I'm a conscious objector. My status is non-combatant. And the kid who was a, he was a corporal. He said, but I got to give you a rifle, Keating. I have to, that's my job. I got to give you a rifle. I said, <laughs> I can't touch the rifle. I said, but give me the serial number and I'll write it down. And when anybody asks me, what my rifle serial number is, I'll know. And then put it aside for me. I said, I'll never use it, but I can't bring it into the bear. Right, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> that, you know, it's just crazy. But, uh, and so I did and I, uh, I spent the whole year. So my assignment under attack was to be a, a communications runner and or driver and uh, when we when we got our war clothes on, everybody had rifles and helmets. I had a helmet and I had um, just a canteen. I didn't have a rifle, and it was. Uh, but uh, so I you went to war before. without a rifle. I mean, that's yeah. kind of remark. Is this is this a common thing? I mean, that sounds terrifying. Well, I don't know about today, but back then it was an army of draftees and enlist and people who volunteered. Yeah. And during the whole Vietnam War, I did some research and there was something like 117,000 granted conscientious objector statuses out of out of the 
two and a half million who served in Vietnam. So we were a very small group. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot My dad of, was a conscientious objector as well. Yes. So he was one of that small group of us. Uh, I could not find out how small the group was of conscience objectors who served in the war. Right. But the overall, for the 11 years the war was on, about 117,000 of us. And a lot of them uh, were combat medics. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a uh, Facebook page that I, I joined, a combat medics page and all the guys, uh, and they were all guys who were combat medics. Most of them didn't carry a weapon and they were out there in the jungle. Some did, but uh, uh, yeah, it was kind of crazy. But again, I was in a big base and we had one sector of the perimeter to defend. And, and uh, so, it, you know, it was, uh, it had been overrun the year before I got there. The Vietnamese had gotten in there, mm-hmm. but they, they were, they were eventually beaten back. But uh, so it was always there, but uh, I mean, you could sit out outside your, your, your wooden barrack any night and look on the horizon about maybe a quarter to a half mile away and you could see a firefight. Mm. People were shooting at each other every night. Yeah, yeah. So, that's incredible. Yeah, but uh, conformity became a, a key survival technique and, it, and uh, it lasted even a few years after I got out of the service. I try to do things right, you know, instead of raging. I mean, when I got to BU, Boston University, for my master's program. And that's where my mom went. Had... <laughs> the, uh, uh, you went the Boston to... Terrier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, School of Education. And uh, it was uh, when I started to, to relax and break away from conformity because it was. Uh, university was pretty stupid then. This was 70, 72, 73. And uh, they were still living in the 50s and everybody else was <laughs> in the 70s, you know. And uh, I would go to class and there'd be anti-war demonstrations going on with the kids and they, they'd have their, uh, their outfits on and I'd be walking to class and I'd have jeans on and my old military jacket and the kids would say, oh, man, that's a cool jacket. Where'd you buy that? You know, I had all my Navy store. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Army Navy store. Yeah. Uh, I said, well, it, I had I got it the hard way. Oh, well, I was yeah, the hard way. Whoa. Yeah, I think you did. Holy yeah. smoke. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's when I started to kind of get away from some of that conformity uh, that had, you know, really much. Uh, was a good skill for me for those two years. Do you think it was harder to leave the military or to leave your religion? I mean, I don't know if you've left your religion. I don't know what your relationship to your religion is now, but it seems I call like myself, I call myself a retired Catholic. Okay. <laughs> you retired. Now, <laughs> I, I still attend church. Oh, okay. Uh, for, the, for, the, for the social, really for the social. Uh, I have a lot of uh, love for some of the uh, the writings and stuff, but the hierarchy the rituals and things. Crazy. Yeah, but the hierarchy drives me crazy. The organization. They're, what? I, right down the street here is a wonderful Episcopal church, and one of the pastors is a woman. You go down to my church, you go down to the other Catholic church, and there's these white-haired old guys, you know? <laughs> I became I Episcopalian I at 25. Uh, I yeah I converted to the, the Episcopal Church so I know I know exactly what you're talking about you know I mean they can have women priests they can have it's a little more it's just more it's like well they call it you know Catholic light which yeah, yeah. it really is it has it has the ritual and the sort of um, the dailiness kind of aspects but um, I see but I I've been to those so easy I've been I've been to our our Episcopal Church on a number of services uh veterans who passed away and stuff like that and and regular services and there's a joy there that i don't see in my church 
It was a joy. And I think it's well, it's just really easy to be Episcopalian. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. It's, <laughs> it's a piece of cake. If you grew up in a Catholic family and then suddenly you become Episcopalian, you're like, what was I? How did I miss out on this for you know decades? Like it's just so. It's, I mean, it's just easy. It's like you can think about it when you want to. No guilt, no confession, no. You know, I mean, it's just kind of like, wow. Yeah. This is, yeah. yeah, this is like fun yeah. religion. Like I could do. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, yeah, it was funny. I, you know, I mean, I think there must be wonderful, fun things about the Catholic Church too, but I've never, I wasn't raised Catholic Catholic, yeah. so I don't know. No, I, well, yeah. There's a, there's a nice source, social element to it that I like. The people I see and, and, and we, we have, you know, the different um, uh, events, you know, uh, potlucks and everything oh yeah they love potlucks yeah and then after church you get to go down in the basement and have your yeah. little you know cookies first, first, that your first kids run around like crazy yeah. the kids run <laughs> and there's so few kids in the episcopal church that they treat them like they're celebrities like i remember because oh. i was a mom with young children well because i think the episcopal church is fading in certain ways which makes me very sad and uh and so if you show mm. up as a mom with young kids they're just like Wow. Yeah. Come in, I, I, <laughs> you know, we're going to give you cookies and yeah. And I do the, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I belong to an Episcopal church in Norfolk, Virginia that had an actual cannonball lodged in the side from like the battle of Yorktown or something like wow. it had, I mean, it was that old. Cause it, I mean, it's the, it's the oldest church in the United States. Anyway, just, sorry. I don't talk to many. I don't usually talk to, I usually I hang around with such a, such liberal friends that we don't talk about the Episcopal Church, but when sometimes I get, woo, get jazzed about the Episcopal. Well, I, Church. Yeah, I, I think I think most organized religions are having trouble with membership. Yeah, I think they all are, and and I know certainly the Catholics are, but uh, uh, I, I, you know, I the 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 hierarchy, it, it, it like I said, it drives me crazy, but. I still I still work with the parish and I still help them out with stuff, um, but they uh, it's not I don't go every day I I rarely go during Sundays. I mean if you remember in the book, the little uh, housemaid on who was a Catholic from the north, and she used to get on my case all the time. She <laughs> saw the rosary, she saw the rosary, and she knew I was a Roman Catholic, and she would. She, she was really sweet, but she went, you go to church this week? You know, and I, if I had time off, I'd go have beers with the guys. I wasn't going to go up to the, where the chaplain was in the parking lot of the, of the, of the base and listen to this guy tell us stuff. Uh, but she was very, very, uh, it was as much of her identity as being Vietnamese. She was a North, uh, uh, North Vietnamese refugee, and she clung to her faith. And God bless her for that. I, uh, I, I don't have that same kind of uh, dedication that she did. But she was, she was a wonderful, wonderful uh, young lady, and uh, that's one of the best stories in the book, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a beautiful book, and I, um, yeah, I hope. I mean, I hope we can uh, maybe accompany our little interview with a, a, um, a segment of, of the book, or maybe with the questions that you answered. Um, I just think it's a, fa it's a fascinating story and you tell it really well. Um, I mean, there's just, there's layers to it that I, uh, uh, and then, and the way you use music, I really appreciate. Oh, that's, a, that's a funny, the yeah, music. that's a funny, I wanted to, I wanted to use more, but again, my editor, being the smart woman, I didn't tell you the story. I, uh, how I met Cat. She lives in my town. Oh, okay. I wondered how. And, and yeah, and I uh, was, and still do write local stories for the local newspaper about veterans and about things. And I did a story. I, I think it was after I had uh, my first story was professionally published by Sean Davis out in Washington. I don't know if you know Sean. 
uh, and he's a good writer, and he, he put together an anthology, and he chose my story about the elephants. Uh, <laughs> the ceramic uh, elephants? Yeah, <laughs> and to put in his anthology. So I wrote a story about it for the local paper. Uh, and this was about five years ago. And as a veteran of foreign wars, and uh, uh, we have these things called poppies, little red poppies. On Memorial Day, we mm -hmm. ask people to donate so we can we can do things for people. And this woman comes up to our booth, and I'm there, and she says, "Oh, you guys are the veterans." And I said, "Yes." And she says, "Well, I'm looking for one of your one of your guys." I said, "Who's that?" She said, "Tom Keating." <laughs> And cool. I said, oh, yeah, that, that's me. She said, well, and she gave me her card. She said, I, I just want to let you know, I enjoyed your story you wrote about the, the elephant thing and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, thanks. And, uh, you know, and off she went. So after another session at the, uh, at the uh, UMass uh, writing course for veterans at the, uh, I can't remember the name of the place, but uh, you'd know it. Uh, I started thinking about writing the book and I did a whole shoo, 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 shoo for, for days and I had this big stack of paper and I knew I had to get it edited and I knew I couldn't afford somebody as famous and as good as she is but I called her to say hey do you know anybody who'd want to help me with my editing I need an editor but I don't have a lot of money I just uh, retired blah, blah, blah. She said, well, why don't you ask me? I said, <laughs> that's wonderful. So that's how, that's how we got. Yeah. Yeah. No, Cat so, Cat is wonderful. And she was with consequence for many years and we are. Well, yes. And, uh, and I, I had the opportunity. This is sad. I had the opportunity to meet George. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I found out that he and I were in the same unit. We were both in the 25th. Infantry oh my goodness. Division. But that's like 20,000 men. And I met him and I told him I'd sell, I'd send him a copy of my book. And he was dead two months later. It happened really Most, quickly. It was really, really I had met him. Um, no, he and he and I, he, I didn't know him very, very well, but I had met him and he was so gracious to me, reaching out to me, emailed me later and, uh, and asked me about, oh my goodness. I mean, uh, just. And, I, and yeah, poetry I think, is wonderful. Oh my God! Well, I wrote a review of uh, I, of his poetry book. Yeah, yeah, he, um, yeah, and I, I think he was just a just a bastion of mm. of goodness in the literary world. Like he, that, he was just so solid. You know, like he would help everyone, and um, I mean, he didn't need to be nice yeah. to me. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I was like, you know, a thirty. <laughs> six-year-old like first-time author he didn't need to give me the time of day but um you know he was incredibly kind uh yeah that's, it was very sad I I, I was really uh it, it bummed me out of course it made everybody else who knew him much better than I did but uh this was a guy who was in the trenches you know and he turned that into such beautiful poetry Maybe. I agree yeah no you're absolutely right yeah his poetry is gorgeous and and it was it was kind of sad because I was such a huge fan of Consequence, and I think when he passed, yeah. it really shook up it their of, yeah. it shook up everything. But they're great now, yeah. Matt um, Matt K. I can't remember how to pronounce his last name, but Matt, who's the editor in chief now, he's actually he's he's actually a really good guy too. And uh, I mean, he like I writes you, oh, he writes you like handwritten thank you notes if you send a donation, like. Uh. <laughs> he's that's the kind of I like I like that old fashioned I like the old fashioned touch like it's very nice but um yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah that was really sad about George and it sounded like that oh uh, we don't need to go into it but it just sounded yeah yeah very hard for um, everyone involved and oh. yeah, the Joiner Institute yeah yeah I was at the William Joiner Institute for two two author sessions and uh that's another you know a victim of the pandemic was the Joiner Institute. Yeah. I enjoyed that so much. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, oh, you didn't know. Oh, I know what I want to. Oh, what? What? War and, what? Peace, <laughs> War and Peace. War and Peace. War and Peace. My 
feelings about war and peace. And, oh, okay, and great, way. yeah. Um, I learned a long time ago, there's not much I can do to, to change the, you know, the the war and peace that's going on. Look at look what's going on in, in Ukraine now and went on in other places. Uh, it's, so my hope and my desire is to, to have peace within my group, to be, you know, at peace with people within my group. One of the quotes in my, in my um, book was from uh, Thomas Merton, who I loved. Uh, peace is something you have or you do not have. If you are yourself at peace, then there are at least some peace in the world. And I kind of try to go by that, which is why I'm in the VFW. You would think I wouldn't be in the Veterans of Foreign Wars, but I'm in it because, again, I think I can help our guys, especially some of the younger ones who face the, the horrific um, bureaucracy of the VA and the VA healthcare system. And they, and they get so frustrated, they, you know, they walk away from it and they shouldn't. They just need to have somebody help them deal with it. I try to do that. And uh, that's why I still work with the church because they need to hear from a normal person like me about our budgets and stuff. You know, what are we, what are we spending our money on? And so I try to help them with that. And uh, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do what Merton said. If you have a little peace within you, then there's a little peace in the world. I, I can't do the big stuff. Nobody can. Well, maybe Biden can, but Certainly not with uh, what's going on today. So, yeah, you know, uh, you know, it's just, uh, and I'm really scared. I think, I think the Russian guy is a wacko, and I think if if he gets really pinned against the corner, he's going to do something really stupid. But, yeah, I don't have any trust in him whatsoever. But <laughs> I like that idea of creating a little world of peace, and I think um, that sounds kind of like what we kind of try to do not to aggrandize ourselves but at no, exactly, like, exactly you know we're right. trying to make a little world where things could be better than they are and it feels good like you know like um we could make things a little better than they currently are so that's Actually, kind of what we're trying to do yeah no i that's <laughs> why i admire the uh, the whole publication and adrian is a facebook friend of mine it's great we all and, love adrian uh, <laughs> Yeah, he he's been very uh, supportive, and uh, uh, I I didn't write a review of his book, but I his latest book, but I I did send him along my impressions of the book and how you know how even today with a volunteer army it's all fucked up, you know how things get really screwy so fast, and uh, uh, it's just amazing. But uh, he's back home now. I hope. Yeah, he is. Yeah. yeah. In fact, he, well, he's at AWP right now in Philadelphia. Oh, he's oh yeah, yeah, AWP's going on yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah. They're, All my I'm cool friends are hanging out. I'm, I'm not even there. No, and you're not there? I know. It was the uh, it was the only week my mom could visit, and so I decided to stay here. But, um, yeah, but. I saw that. I, I didn't have, um, I got all the information because I'm a member, but I didn't uh, uh, I didn't uh, didn't want to go down there. Well, I'm you should go sometime if it's closer to you because the um, yeah the, the yeah. war writers dinner is really fun. Yeah, I know. Peter I mean, Moline puts that together. Are you probably yeah. Facebook friends? With I know Peter. Peter. Yeah. 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 So yeah, no, I mean it's a, you know I'm still a newbie in all this. I mean I've only been doing this for three years really, and I'm still learning about all these people and 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 you know thank God for. Twitter and Facebook. I would never have known who these people are. But uh, yeah, um, uh, that's why I missed the joiner because I used to meet everybody at the joiner. Um, <laughs> I saw all the good writers. But uh, um, yeah, I, I hopefully, I mean, this is how close can you get to Philadelphia? Because I don't know where they usually have it out in Colorado or someplace. Oh, God. I think the next one's in like Seattle. There's uh, one in there's one in Kansas City, which I know I can make because that's very close to me. I'm in Colorado, yeah. but yeah. Seattle's a little far. Yeah. Um, Philadelphia was just pretty far. And it's just, and it, and it can get very expensive unless mm -hmm. you do maybe like an Airbnb kind of 
deal. But I, like, I don't I don't trust Airbnb. <laughs> the hotels I'm are sorry. very expensive. Well, yeah. I I'm I just was on the phone this morning with the uh, Hilton. Uh, it's the 40th anniversary of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in November, mm. and I was there in. in uh, um, five years ago for the 35th and I was a reader of names. Mm. So we read all the names that are on the, mm -hmm. on the wall. And I'm going again. I'm going again in, in November this year. Mm -hmm. And they called me up about, about three weeks ago. I had written a story about going to be a reader of the names. Uh, and uh, it got published in uh, their magazine, the veteran, the Vietnam Veteran Magazine. For the, they called me and said they're doing a, a commemorative book about the, the whole memorial and they wanted to include my story in the commemorative book well I said, sure <laughs> well sure. congratulations yeah yeah isn't that cool so that's i really said to my cool. wife we have to go down again we have to go down there and, and yeah god the prices i was talking to the hotel people and the prices are what yeah, no, mean? big cities these days. It's crazy. I, I, I mean, yeah. I just think hotels in cities are outlandishly I, expensive. I don't know how you're I, supposed to stay anywhere. How, how, how I mean, yeah, uh, of course, it's Washington and it's a big, you know, uh, uh, credit card account place and everybody. But boy, I mean, the last time I was there five years ago, the room was, I think, $190 a night. Now it's 280 it's crazy. crazy. Same room. That is crazy. That is crazy. Oh, Plus, you got to anyway. pay for your food. You got, you know, you've got all oh. this other stuff. Oh, oh, it's so much. It's so much. It's yeah. it's 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 nuts. It's nuts. Um, and what was the other? There was one more thing I wanted to that you would put down, and I I wrote a. It was about the violence. Okay. Uh, You would ask me about the violence. Uh, yeah, you mentioned having into revulsion to violence. And I think I added to that. Okay, I'll read it. I'll read it to you. Uh, I had mentioned that my dad and I watched a demonstration in Chicago in 60. Right, okay. And we both were revulsed. Uh, by that police riot and it was a really a real time for us to connect as intergenerational he was a you know he was of the world war ii generation and uh and uh, so it was it was a a great shared moment but there were incidents and that when i didn't have that aversion or that revulsion to violence obviously when i put the knife against the kid's throat uh, and a, a lot of it had to do with the fact that army training will brainwash me for a number of months. Uh, that accident on the road to the elephant factory where, where one of the trucks ran over the young man and we didn't stop. Well, we couldn't stop, but even so it was. Eh. And then uh, seeing the firefights a quarter mile away at night, knowing somebody's getting killed, either a Vietnamese person or an American person, it was just like watching a movie. And uh, so uh, uh, the revulsion uh, came and went, I guess is the way to say it. Um, I was bothered by all of it and I was uh, appalled by it at times, but once I was over there, it became like a daily thing. Now, of course, that, that left when I got back and I was no longer in a war situation, but, uh, and I think everybody is appalled with what's going on in Ukraine now, with the exception of some Republicans. But um, it, it, it's it is. Uh, I hear a dog. My dog. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it, it was uh, again. It was part of that army brainwashing that we went through. Amazing that I broke it. That it broke through that, and I think that's because. The five and a half years in the seminary, that the it finally the soul finally woke up and 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 then kicked me in the head and said, "Hey, 
you're not supposed to be doing this, you know. You may not going to be a priest, but you're not supposed to shoot people either. And I, I'm amazed that that happened. I love that line. The soul finally woke up and kicked me in the head. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel. That's pretty good. That's a pretty oh. good sign. Well, let me write that down too. No. <laughs> I know. the soul. The, my soul woke up and kicked me in the head. Um, <laughs> well... Is it all right if I put if I put our conversation on Rathbering Tree? Sure. I mean, what are you gonna do? Make a um, you're not gonna edit the video, are you? I was or just gonna, gonna put up the whole video. Oh, okay. Is that all right. right? Do you need yeah, do you need any biographical material or pictures? Yeah, I'll there? I'll send you a message about that and then okay. we can put that up. And then I'll put up the okay. answers that you wrote for me. Um okay. but I think that this would be very apropos for a lot of the viewers of Rathbrain Tree. I think uh, cool. that'd be, that'd be an honor. Yeah, an honor. well, it's an honor. It was an honor to talk to you, and I I really appreciate. Finally, yeah, you got your face. I, to face. <laughs> I thought, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it was really nice to finally get to talk to you face to face, Good. and um, and I hope we can talk again. And Absolutely. Uh, I uh, I'm very excited about this book, and we'll uh, and we'll. We'll, we'll promote it and um thank you yes if there are any viewers this is <laughs> yesterday's soldier by tom keating it is absolutely worth your read uh just thank a fascinating you. fascinating well-written philosophical and very heartfelt uh story and it asks i can tell you had a catholic education because you ask you like to ask questions <laughs> But I've always had an affinity for that. So um, <laughs> it's, I think it's really good. So yes, uh, yesterday's soldier. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You it. have a good weekend. You too. Weekend, yay. All right. Yay. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Tom.